Professor Steve O'Keefe from Pittsburgh is one of our esteemed uh, teacher in the 12th Nestle Nutrition Institute course on clinical nutrition and he gives a presentation about nutrition in short bowel syndrome. Steve, what are the essentials, what are the key messages from your presentation in the developments in short bowel syndromes? Well, short bowel syndrome is a highly, or the management of short bowel syndrome is a highly specialized uh, objective because it involves so many different factors. And, um, you know, starting off from the initial loss of the bowel, taking the patient through the process of adaptation, changing IV requirements over time because of the changes in adaptation. And um, every patient is different, um, primarily because their disease is, that the, the, the reason that they lost their bowel in the first place is, is different. And so therefore treatment has to be individualized. Um, so it really is, it's a long-term um, commitment uh, between you and the patient um, because with home TB, and I'm, I think I should actually emphasize that short bowel syndrome is a big spectrum of diseases. So it can be very mild and just managed with oral feeding or changes in diet. But what I'm going to be focusing on is the right extreme where you've got what's called short bowel intestinal failure, which means that you are dependent on IV uh, fluids and IV nutrition for survival. And it's that group that has all the complications, the problems, the management problems, and so on, and where we desperately need advances um, in our treatment to improve their quality of life. Have you seen in the past some advances in home parental nutrition management? Not, um, not much until very recently. Um, in the past, management has, has primarily depended upon trying to work with the patient's remaining bowel to optimize what remaining absorption there might be um, with the use of changing dietary intake from large meals to small frequent meals and then using um, drugs that cut down on the rate of motility so that the food stays in contact with the remaining bowel for longer and suppressing fluid losses. Um, that really has, has been you know, the basis of management, but there have been some exciting developments recently. First of all, well, mainly looking at peptide hormones to see whether or not you can enhance the natural adaptation process. Um, starting with recombinant uh, growth hormone and uh, a number of studies showed that, that in fact indeed it did increase absorption. The problem was that growth hormone is non-specific to the bowel, it affects the rest of the body just like an acromegaly and so therefore has a lot of unwanted side effects and so therefore the search was on to look at something which m was more specific to the gut. Um, part of the natural adaptation process and that led to the, um, the, the exploration of ideal break peptides and in particular GLP-2. You mentioned GLP-2, the studies are very beneficial but the cost for this treatment is uh, very, very expensive. Can we afford uh, this cost or what is the the cost-benefit relation uh, using such uh, fancy drugs today? That's an excellent question and <clears throat> I don't really have a simple answer for you. Um, the problem with um, the development of analogs of peptides and so on is that it, the research that goes into developing these drugs takes years and um, with tuduclotide, which is the GLP-2 analog, uh, that is currently marketed. Um, that time was about 15 years. So there's enormous recuperation of costs that the company has to do. And so therefore it can't be cheap. It would be great if it were just like, you know, taking aspirin or uh, an antibiotic or something like that. Um, but 
so it, it is expensive, and uh, the expense is going to vary from country to country. I'm not sure what the costs are like in Europe, um, but cl clearly the company would have to be pragmatic so that it does fit into uh, the realm of reimbursement from their insurance company. Mm -hmm. and, and bear in mind, you know, if, I mean, the holy grail with treatment of short bowel syndrome or short bowel syndrome in spinal failure is to try and get patients off IVs completely because only that would improve their quality of life. And um, um, if you can do that, then you save on TPN and home TPN for a year is also very expensive and very labor intensive. So, so we're talking about a very small proportion of the population who would be dead without home TPN. And so, you know, this is a life-saving therapy. And this is going one step further to try and boost the normal adaptation process to get more patients independent of IVs. It's a fascinating approach, but you can speculate how many patients you can wean from TPN, how many patients will be free of home TPN, one of ten, ten yeah, of um, hundred. So that, that's an excellent question. And um, at the moment, we've only got clinical trials to go on uh, because it was in America, it was only released by the FDA last year, or no, actually the beginning of this year for, for, for market for general use. And so we don't know what, how it's going to improve general practice. Uh, but we can say from, from the clinical trial set up um, through NPS, the people who developed it in, in USA, um, I think there are, are about 15 patients who have been weaned off TPN so far. And the number is gradually increasing. And what, what's fascinating about the drug is that you would have thought that a peptide would have an immediate response and then it would plateau yes. off. But, you know, it seems to have a sustained improvement over a period of three years, up to three years, which is unexplainable to me unless, you know, the adaptation process carries on a lot longer than we originally thought two years, you know, couldn't go any further than that. So, so I think that, that we'll see that once the drug becomes available yes. in clinical practice. And my last question is about uh, intestinal transplantation. Is this still increasing or maybe with the new drugs we can also reduce the need for transplantation? Well, I know that um, uh, small, bowel, small bowel transplantation was less used in Europe than was used in yes. Pittsburgh. And there were some excellent studies by Peroni and a few others looking at that and reasons for that. Um, you know, small bowel transplantation um, is absolutely remarkable in its ability to get patients off, predictably, off all IVs. And, um, you know, having had the privilege of working in, in Pittsburgh, which is the largest small bowel transplant center in the world, um, you know, I was exposed to a lot of outcomes in patients who, for instance, have been on home, home TPM for 30, 35 years yes. since childhood, and suddenly they had a normal gut and they could eat normally, and we had to reteach them how to eat because they never really learned. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so there's nothing else that can do that. You know, even the GLP-2s, they reduce the requirement, but they don't put you right back to normal. But of course, it's a major surgery, and so therefore the mortality is significant, and those who don't do well don't do well. Yes. So I think the answer is that if you live near a big center that does a lot of transplantation, then it is a true option. But if you don't, then it's not an option. You should not do it. <laughs> right. Thank you so much for this interview. Thank you. Not at all. Thank you, Remy.